Hello everybody and welcome back to a brand new episode of Mega Projects. This one is all about the hunt for the Unabomber. You might be thinking, is this really a Mega Project? And as I always say, well you catch the Unabomber and let me know how it goes. Also before we get started, if you're like to pick up some fine merch in time for Christmas, well it might not be in time for Christmas because this video, I don't know when it goes out, maybe it's January, maybe Christmas has already passed, but Get yourself a Mega Projects t-shirt. This one, we've got a whole bunch of them actually. This one is of the Saturn V. I don't know how easily you can see that. But uh, it's in blue because it's like a blueprint. But you can also get it in other colors for reasons, I guess. Megamerch.co is where you go. Also, one final plug and then I promise we'll get into it. I have a new podcast. It's called The Casual Criminalist. Now, we've covered like this is all about the Unabomber on my other channels. Anytime I ever do something about crimes or dark stuff, people are like, I love it. So we made a podcast all about crimes and dark stuff. It's about an hour long. It covers things from like the UK doctor who was the worst serial killer in history, the American socialite who murdered their best friend with a car, allegedly, and got away with it, and a lot more. There's a link to the casual criminalist below. Please do check it out. And finally, the video begins. Smash that dislike button. Between 1978 and 1996, America experienced a new type of fear, an unknown, unpredictable, faceless fear. Over 18 years, 16 separate mail bombs were dispatched around the United States, either through the Postal Service or by hand, resulting in three deaths and 23 injuries. The search for whoever was behind the attacks became one of the longest running and most expensive FBI investigations in history, and one that came to be known as the hunt for the Unabomber. You knew that, because you clicked on this video. This is a little outside of what we normally do here at Mega Projects, but who said that large scale projects need to be composed of concrete and steel? Ollie wrote this. I totally agree with him, but I already said it in the introduction, but uh, there we are. The investigation into these attacks spawned an absolute colossus, with over 150 full-time investigators or analysts eventually becoming involved. This became a relentless obsession for many working on this case, as the number and elaborate nature of bombs steadily increased. But it wasn't until February 1996 that investigators received a tip-off which finally led to the arrest of the Unabomber. The attacks, which had spanned from California to Connecticut, from Utah to Illinois, were finally over. But this story begins almost 20 years before, with a suspicious package appearing at Northwestern University in Evanston, Illinois. By the late 1970s, the phrase domestic terrorism was rarely used in the United States. While we have become more accustomed to this expression, especially after the Oklahoma City bombing in 1995, the Centennial Park bombing in Atlanta in 1996, and the Boston Marathon bombing in 2013, the notion of large-scale attacks on U.S. soil by U.S. citizens was certainly not new. Most of the early forms of domestic terrorism occurred against African Americans, Native Americans, or other minorities, and it wasn't until the late 90s and early 20th century, the cases began to widen, with several attacks attributed to the growing anarchist movement. The Wall Street bombing of 1920 is a perfect example of this, an attack that killed 40 people and the case was never solved. The anarchist theme is one that we're going to be coming back to, as this was close to the Unabomber's heart, so it's probably worth a quick explanation. Anarchism is a political philosophy that has its roots in ancient China and Greece, but back then it was discussed in conjunction with various other ideas, such as Taoism and Stoicism, a way of questioning and rebelling against hierarchy. It began to gain traction during the French Revolution and in the subsequent century, probably reaching its zenith during the first half of the 20th century when attacks in the most prominent cities across the globe became worryingly common, leading to them sometimes being singled out as the world's first terrorists. World War II severely weakened the anarchist movement, but by the 60s and 70s, sprouts were once again appearing. On May 25, 1978, a package was discovered in a car park at Northwestern University. It had the return address of Buckley Christ, a professor of material engineering at the university. The package was returned to Christ, who immediately became suspicious, as he obviously hadn't sent it. Campus police were summoned, and as Officer Terry Marker opened the package, the rudimentary bomb inside went off. Thankfully, Marker escaped with only minor injuries, but others to come would not be so fortunate. 
But it was almost a year until the second bomb arrived on the 9th of May 1979 again at Northwestern University. The result was almost identical, with graduate student John Harris receiving only minor injuries. However, what came six months later changed everything. As American Airlines 444 climbed into the sky after departing from Chicago on the 15th of November 1979, all seemed well. On board were 72 passengers and six crew members. Midway through the two-hour-long flight, a sucking explosion occurred, originating in the cargo hold. Shortly after, smoke began seeping into the main cabin, along with a significant loss of pressure as passengers frantically fumbled for their oxygen masks. Captain Donald M. Tyner was quickly redirected to Dallas Airport in Washington. The plane was able to land safely. Of those on board, 12 needed medical assistance due to smoke inhalation, but once again, this had been a huge slice of luck. The bomb which had been placed in the cargo hold had failed to detonate properly due to a faulty timer mechanism. What had been designed to down American Airlines 444 simply led to a lot of smoke and a lot of fear. But an attempted attack on an aircraft constitutes a federal crime, and it was here that not only the FBI became involved, but we also have the first use of the word Unabomber. Well, sort of. The acronym Unabom actually came from university and airline bombing, but would later be adopted by the insatiable media coverage that would follow, and it became Unabomber. While investigations into the two earliest bombs were already underway, it is here that we see the first surge in terms of the Unabomber investigation. However, the early stages proved fruitless, with all three bombs being made of scrap metal that could be sourced from anywhere in the country. The connection between the attacks also baffled investigators. What was the connection between Northeastern University and American Airlines? Between June 1980 and July 1982, four more bombs were delivered in Illinois, Utah, Tennessee, in California. The bombs were growing in complexity and power, and while no deaths were recorded during this period, the final victim of the group, John Hauser, a graduate student at the University of Berkeley, lost four fingers and his sight in one eye. The investigation was still struggling at this point, but it had come to a vague assumption that whoever was behind these attacks had been born and raised in the Chicago area, but had later lived in both Utah and the San Francisco Bay Area, an assumption that was eventually proven correct. But apart from that, they were clutching at straws. The bomber's occupation, motive, and even sex were keenly debated. Some thought it was the work of an aircraft mechanic, others a scientist. Several female suspects were looked at closely, but the prevailing sentiment was that it was most likely a man because, well, let's just be honest, it's almost always a man. The bombs were made of everyday scrap materials, including wood, fishing wire, nails, and tape, and of course, there was not the faintest sign of a single fingerprint. In an interview in 2017, FBI criminal profiler James R. Fitzgerald gave an insight into just how far the Unabomber was going to cover his tracks. He suggested that according to lab tests, the Unabomber had torn off the skins of the batteries he used and also created his own adhesive by melting down deer hooves. No other single year saw as many attacks as 1985. The attack on John Hauser was the first of four bombs that year. The second, addressed to the Boeing Company in Auburn, Washington, was successfully defused, but the fourth, on the 11th of December 1985, resulted in the Unabomber's first death. Hugh Scruton was killed by a nail and splinter loaded bomb placed in the car park of his computer store in Sacramento, California. The bombs, which had begun as almost amateurish, had now become increasingly sophisticated and deadly. But still, investigators struggled to pin down viable suspects, let alone the bomber himself. Two years went by until the next attack occurred in Salt Lake City, where again the target was the owner of a computer store. But this one was different. For the first time, an eyewitness saw the Unabomber plant the bomb. The sketch that was done after the initial interview with the female witness has become iconic and it fueled a media now desperate for any scrap of information. The image of a white male with his hood up, aviator sunglasses, and a scraggly moustache was the world's first glimpse of the Unabomber. Surely now it was just going to be a matter of time, but that's not how things worked out. Most likely chastised by the slip that revealed his image to the world, the Unabomber did not send another bomb for six years. By this point, the task force charged with apprehending the Unabomber had grown to include over 150 agents from the FBI, ATF, and the US Postal Inspection Service. But still, 
but they were unable to reach any firm conclusions. This was in part down to the false clues that had been included in every bomb. The first were the initials FC printed discreetly somewhere on the device. No doubt that led investigators down a monumental rabbit hole as they struggled with every known meaning of FC that they could think of. It was eventually found to mean Freedom Club. On one bomb that was diffused, a note was found that read, Woo, it works. I told you it would. RV. The same stamp was also used on the packages, a Eugene O'Neill $1 stamp. Did this have any specific meaning? Well, maybe, but nobody ever discovered why it was always used. Then there were the items often included in the packages, usually pieces of tree branches or bark. Two of his victims had the surname Wood, which led the FBI to theorize some kind of connection with nature and trees. Again, a fact that would eventually be proved correct. It's probably difficult to describe the maddening nature of this investigation. Sadly, those working on the case were left waiting for the next attack in the hope that the bomber might make a mistake. But he never did. As the years ticked past without any further attacks or significant leads in the case, the memory of the Unabomber eventually began to fade. Between June 1993 and April 1995, four more bombs were delivered. The Unabomber had returned, and with him came the deadliest bomb so far. The first two caused severe injuries to Charles Epstein and David Galanto, with the last two bombs the Unabomber ever sent causing the deaths of Thomas J. Marser and Gilbert Brent Murray. Once again, fear gripped the nation. It is perhaps fitting that the downfall of the Unabomber came not through the thousands of hours worth of FBI investigation, but from his own hands. In June 1995, just a month after he had claimed his third victim, a manifesto purported to be from the Unabomber arrived at the offices of the Washington Post and the New York Times, along with a note stating that if a major newspaper printed it, he would desist from terrorism. The 35,000-word essay was immediately passed to the FBI, and the vast array of investigators set upon the text in search of clues. But there was also the dilemma of whether to authorize its publication or not. Some argued that the United States shouldn't give in to threats, with the note equating to little more than blackmail. However, Attorney General Janet Reno and FBI Director Louis Freer felt differently and believed in publishing it widely in the hope that somebody reading it might see something familiar. Strangely enough, it was not one of the major publications who initially gave the go-ahead to publish it, but none other than Penthouse Magazine. The idea was floated, but the response from the Unabomber reportedly in a phone call, was firm. He stated that Penthouse was less respectable than the New York Times and the Washington Post, and said that to increase our chances of getting our stuff published in some respectable periodical, he would reserve the right to plant one and only one bomb intended to kill after our manuscript had been published in Penthouse instead of the larger papers. On September 19, 1995, the Washington Post published the manifesto. Okay, so here's where things start to get significantly more complicated. After the publication of the Unabomber's Manifesto, the country got its first glimpse into the mind of a man who had terrorized the country for approaching 20 years, but oddly to many, it didn't seem as deranged as they had anticipated. Titled Industrial Society and Its Future, the sprawling manifesto begins with its author railing against the Industrial Revolution and calling for a return to wild nature. They went on to chastise both the left and the right. The left, who we saw as driven primarily by feelings of inferiority and over-socialization, and the right as people who whine about the decay of traditional values, yet they enthusiastically support technological progress and economic growth. He discussed at length his perceived corruption of society and the dangers that lay ahead if our rampant technological advances were not curtailed. It was blistering, rambling, but much of it made sense. Now let me explain that last remark just a little bit. The Unabomber's Manifesto was received by some as mere lunacy, but for many, it was far from the jabberings of a lunatic. The fears about how society was evolving were fears that had been growing for some time. Certainly not mainstream, far from it, in fact, but his argument that life had become widespread psychological suffering for many struck a chord. To put it simply, if this manifesto had been released by a Harvard professor, it would likely have been hailed as a little lefty, a little far-fetched, but it ultimately made some good points. The fact that a domestic terrorist was openly saying these things must have sat just a little uncomfortably for many. But, as I mentioned earlier, it was the manifesto which brought an end to the Unabomber. A woman named Linda Patrick studied the language of the manifesto and couldn't help but feel that it sounded familiar. 
She showed it to her husband, David Kaczynski, and asked him whether it reminded him of anything, and it certainly did. David Kaczynski began poring over old letters from his then estranged brother Ted, in particular those written to local newspapers in which he rallied against modern technology. It all sounded eerily familiar, but as strange as it sounds, giving a tip off to the FBI wasn't so straightforward at this point. On average, they were receiving a thousand calls a day in response to the one million dollars on offer for information leading to the Unabomber's capture. Instead, David Kaczynski hired a private investigator to examine where Ted was and what he was doing. Later, after deciding he would take it to the FBI, he hired Washington attorney Tony Bisegli to act as a go-between, hoping to remain anonymous. FBI criminal profiler Clinton R. Van Zant was the first to analyze the letters in David Kaczynski's possession. He concluded that there was more than a 60% chance that the manifesto and the letters were written by the same people. Bisegli shared another essay written by Ted Kaczynski, which was passed on to the San Francisco-based task force, although through linguistic analysis they were able to give an even higher assurance that this was indeed the Unabomber. David Kaczynski was brought in for questioning, so much for anonymity, and cooperated fully with the investigation over the next two months. By early April, a search warrant had been authorized. Born in Chicago on the 22nd of May 1944, Ted Kaczynski excelled academically as a child. After graduating from Harvard with a degree in mathematics in 1962 and eventually teaching maths at the University of Michigan, he suddenly quit in 1969. In 1971, he moved to a small remote cabin near Lincoln, Montana, where he hoped to become self-sufficient. But it was here that a fury regarding the state of the world truly took hold. In an interview after his arrest, he said that on finding a new road through a patch of unspoilt land, he decided that rather than trying to acquire further wilderness skills, I would work on getting back at the system. Revenge. When you think about a criminal mastermind capable of spreading fear across the United States, you might anticipate a more sophisticated hideout than a simple shack in the woods. But that was exactly where they found Ted Kaczynski, along with bomb-making equipment, a diary of past attacks, and even one bomb ready to be mailed. The FBI had found the Unabomber. There was little question of Kaczynski's guilt, as they say he had been caught red-handed. Initially, his lawyer attempted to argue an insanity defense, but this was rejected by Kaczynski himself. On the 22nd of January 1998, Kaczynski pled guilty to all charges, 10 counts of illegally transporting, mailing and using bombs, and 3 counts of murder. And in doing so, he managed to escape the death penalty. He's currently serving 8 life sentences without the possibility of parole at ADX Florence, a supermax prison in Florence, Colorado. And so, one of the longest-running and most expensive FBI investigations in U.S. history finally came to a close 20 years after the first bomb at Northwestern University. Kaczynski has since written a book, Technological Slavery, released in 2010, and receives a large number of correspondences from people around the world every year. The release of the manifesto altered many people's opinions on Kaczynski. Before, he was the cold-blooded maniac, but his 35,000-word essay showed a very different side. He may still be a maniac who does deserves to never see freedom again. But his thoughts and ideas on the direction society was headed resonated with many. And if we look at how we have done since the release of the manifesto in 1995, it's difficult to categorically argue against these statements. As for the investigation, what had cost the US taxpayer an estimated $50 million was finally at an end, but it raised significant questions over the ability of US law enforcement to track and apprehend domestic terrorists, especially those acting alone lone wolf, as they say. The case of the Unabomber exposed a degree of powerlessness. If those carrying out the attacks know what they're doing, the $50 million did not lead to the arrest of the Unabomber. Far from it. Instead, it was Ted Kaczynski's own words and his desire to share them with the world which led to his downfall. So I really hope you found this video interesting. I know it's a little bit of a departure from what we normally do, but I certainly think it was a mega project. If you'd like to see more criminal style stuff, I mentioned at the beginning a new podcast I'm doing called The Casual Criminalist. It shall be linked to below. Also, you can go to megamerch.co if you want to buy some merch and you know, pick up one of these fine looking t-shirts. Thank you for watching.